At night, weary with my day's work, but full of joy at having done it. So to bed, fearing that I've got some cold sitting in my loose garments all this day. The 30th of July, 1665. Recommended by Who Do You Think You Are magazine and featured on BBC Radio. An audio library for the genealogists with too much time on their hands. Here's your presenter, Malcolm Noble. Hello everyone, thank you for being there and welcome to episode 30 of the Talk Genealogy podcast. We call it the monthly podcast for the genealogists with too much time on their hands. I hope your family history work is going well. Have you started on the catalogue yet? Now, a little over a year ago, I posted an episode which spoke about how looking at the life of William Shakespeare could offer some signposts for the nowadays genealogist. This has proved to be one of our more popular episodes, so I thought we'd spend this month thinking about what suggestions for our research we can find when looking at the life of Samuel Pepys. You know him, he wrote a diary. The podcast for the genealogists with too much time on their hands, with Malcolm Noble. Now, I have to say from the start that Sam is one of my favourite colourful characters in England's history, and he lived at a time when London offered so much for those who understood the city. Pepys was there when important questions were decided though not always finally. And guess what? He died with his head on. My goodness me. Tonight we're going to pick at the different strands in his life and ask, what does this say about the different ways of researching family history? Now, the old episode was called Take William Shakespeare, for example. So this one is called Take Peeps, for example. But first, I need to remind you that I'm neither a professional nor an expert. I'm an enthusiast like you who has spent more than 50 years digging up his family tree. And hey, I've got it wrong so often. So these podcasts are really no more than me sharing with you some of the lessons that I've learned along the way. And I need to emphasise, as always, I am talking about ancestor hunting in England. Getting on with tonight's podcast, let's start with just a couple of minutes of Samuel's life. Now, our last podcast, that would be number 29, looked at clandestine marriages in the Fleet area of London. And you know, tonight we're beginning in the same neck of the woods. Samuel Pepys was born in Salisbury Court, Fleet Street, on the 23rd of February 1633. There's an entry for his baptism at St Bride's Church, on the 3rd of March, 1633. 200 years later, a bride and groom on my family tree will be married in that same church. But hey, that's by the by. Samuel was the son of John Pepys, 1601 to 1680, a tailor, and Margaret Pepys, née Kite, who died in 1667. She was the daughter of a white chapel butcher. So, at first glance, we're talking about a family of shopkeepers. Samuel was their fifth child, and I went on to have 11, but he was the oldest survivor. He was a bright kid. He studied at St Paul's and Oxford, and secured the patronage of Earl Montagu, a supporter, through the rest of his life. Montagu was later created the first Earl of Sandwich. Pepys married young, he was 22, and his wife... Elizabeth de Saint-Michel was just 14 years old, a descendant of French Huguenot immigrants. They were married first in a religious ceremony on the 10th of October 1655 and later on the 1st of December at St Margaret's Westminster. Now more about that marriage later. He went into the civil service. When he started his famous starry, he was just 27, living in Axe Yard and he was poor. He might reasonably have argued that if his promising future didn't catch up with him PDQ, his future would come too late. He was a clerk to the King's ships. Then he was clerk of the Privy Seal. 
and appointed the Surveyor General of the Victualling Office, and then eventually Secretary to the Admiralty. Now, he discontinued his diary in 1669, fearing declining eyesight. In 1683, he accompanied Dartmouth on a trip to Tangier, which produced a very valuable journal, but a different one in nature than the famous diary. However, his career was not without hiccups. He lost his job in 1672 and again in 1684. He didn't marry again after the death of his wife and he left no acknowledged children. But Samuel Pepys enjoyed 15 years retirement, something that not every man could look forward to. I say enjoyed, intellectually probably, but he spent much of his later life in pain. Now, I admire Pepys because he was an outstanding administrator. I like organising stuff, and he could sense history when it happened. You know, I wish I'd had the opportunities for spectating on the events which the mid-17th century presented. Some people say that he invented the modern civil service. No, I don't know about that, but it's certainly the main building of the current civil service college carries his name. But of course he is best remembered for his diary. And you know, I think that's how he would have liked things to be. So let's just spend a couple of minutes on that adventure. Now famously, he wrote in shorthand, sometimes called a cipher, but that's not really in the way that we mean it today. He kept it going for nine years, so it covered the Great Plague of London, the Great Fire and the Restoration, but not the Glorious Revolution, and that's a shame. He got it bound in posh covers, and he gave it to his old college at Cambridge, where it sat for two centuries, more or less. Incidentally, he gave the rest of his library to the college as well, including the bookcases and his own catalogue. Hmm, how many of our personal libraries have been catalogued, I wonder? But uh, the diary wasn't lost. Folk knew it was there, but no one really settled to the project of transcribing it until the 19th century. Now, over the years, there's been a number of editions published. John Smith transcribed it originally, and he released it in uh, 1825. A second transcription came from Minus Bright, which was published from 1875. And then Henry Wheatley published his edition in the 1890s, and that was revised in 1926, and for many years that was like the standard edition. But then the complete edition was transcribed by Latham and Matthews, releasing it sequentially from 1970, and that is now seen as the definitive edition. TalkGenealogy.blog here is the website that supports the monthly podcast for the genealogists with too much time on their hands. You'll find links to previous episodes, a full list of books mentioned in the series, one or two details about other genealogy work I've done, and every now and then, though more then than now, a bit of a blog. Building an audio library for the genealogists with too much time on their hands. <laughs> So that's the life and works of Samuel Pepys. What's in it for today's genealogist? Well, I think there are half a dozen lessons that we can pick out of that. First off, if your family lived in London from 1660 to 1669, the diary is a first-hand guide to that city and what they would have seen around them. It's a very personal account, but a vibrant one. It comes with all the smells, mud, mucky habits, not to say inequality, that went along with the emerging culture and literature of the mid-17th century England. And one of my favourite passages really helps you get the feel of what it was like living in those days. Whither my father, wife and Ashwell came, where we had but a poor dinner and not well dressed, besides... The very sight of my aunt's hands and greasy manner of carving did almost turn my stomach. After dinner, by coach to the king's playhouse, where we saw but part of wit without money, which I do not like. But coming late put me out of tune and it costed me four half crowns for myself and my company. 
and that's taken from the 22nd of April 1663. You know, perhaps the first thing to note is that although Pepys was born into quite modest circumstances, a status that might have been called trade, his family is nevertheless mentioned in the Herald's Visitation of Cambridgeshire. Now, we looked at the work of the Heralds in episode 2 of these podcasts, and you may want to go back to that for comment in greater detail. But just to recap, the Heralds wanted to research every family who claimed a right to bear arms, so this is usually the better connected families. But Samuel Pepys' example demonstrates to us that it is always worth checking this and other printed sources. So here is the Cambridge Visitation of 1619 and we find the pedigree, only four generations, that goes back to Margaret Pepys who died in 1529. First thing is that the Herald's Visitations are very poor on dates and places and absolutely vague on sources. So you've got to follow on behind them and check on what it all means, but it is a useful guide of where to look. So what can we say about the Pepys family history? Well, his great uncle was Talbot Pepys, and his cousin, once removed, was Sir Richard Pepys, and they were both members of Parliament for Cambridge and Sudbury, respectively. Richard was also a Baron of the Exchequer, and he was appointed Lord Chief Justice of Ireland in 1655. So here are two hints which research into Pepys' background may offer us. 1. You don't have to be a notable or well-known family to be linked to one of the gentry in the Herald's visitations. Samuel's branch were shopkeepers, so it is always worth a check. In fact, I would go as far as to say that if you're likely to be researching a particular county for a long time, and let's face it, most of us are digging away for years, then it may be worth gaining just a little familiarisation of the families mentioned in the visitations. As I said, the heralds looked at those families who claimed a right to bear arms, but there are mountains of collateral lines in that lot. So, the Herald's visitation is always worth a look. But before we move on, I'd like to reinforce that point that it's worth checking on printed sources. I was, some weeks ago, browsing through a copy of Nottinghamshire County Pedigrees. Now, my family tree in Nottinghamshire is very much not of county families. But I found, almost as a curiosity, that the compiler had included a detailed 17th century pedigree relating to one of my great time something grandmas. It corroborated my own research, lending it a little more authority. It described some collateral descents, which I hadn't bothered with, and included two photographs of the cottage where my distant cousins lived 200 years ago, and offered something of a light-hearted character sketch. Now, shall we smile and call this the serendipity of genealogy? Or is it a pointer towards an avenue of research that should always be covered? The printed sources. I've written myself a book. Hello everyone, I'm taking time out to support the release of my history about the plague in a Nottinghamshire village in 1604. In 1604, the Trentside village of Bleasley in Nottinghamshire was hit by the bubonic plague. It took off a hundred, give or take a soul or two, from a population that was, best guess, a touch over 300. The plague in Bleasley. A Nottinghamshire village survives its summer of death. You'll find out more about it at plaguingbleasby.com. Building an audio library for the genealogists with too much time on their hands.
Now, my second point, hey, once again, is that Pepys' circumstances reminds us of the importance for collateral lines. Too often, collateral lines are offered as a means of simply narrowing the search for a missing ancestor, but their greater value is establishing a broader context so that we can see what is going on. I have found that you need only to be at the wrong end of a litter for a couple of generations for the whole family circumstances to be very different than the better off branches. The next step is to look at Pepys's progress. His career through the Admiralty was due to the patronage of Lord Montague, as I've said. And if we dig into Montague's family, we find that the Pepys and the Montagues were indeed related. Now, if we draw the parallel with a farm labourer, a craftsman or tradesman, we might want to explore again why they were attached to employers. Now, pretty soon we're going to find ourselves looking into apprenticeships or domestic service of some sort. Here, you see, is that same question that we might have asked in Pepys's progress. Why then and why them? Here, I'm drawing a fairly broad lesson from that example. Look at the family background of those who touched the lives of your ancestors. It will rarely be a waste of time, and you may be surprised by the number of times that it throws up another lead. So we're looking behind what is happening to your ancestor. Relate it to what is going on in the community. Now in Pepys' case, his ups and downs were much to do with national history. He lost his job in the 1670s because he was suspected of involvement in the Popish plot. In fact, he was thrown into the tower for a short period. And if we spend some time looking into that intrigue, we learn something of the circles in which Pepys moved. Also, by looking at the enemies, we conversely learn something of his own personality. Again, he had to retire at the time of the Great Revolution. He wasn't going to be favoured in a strongly Protestant administration. What does that say about Pepys's faith? We can see that Pepys's life, like all lives, was disrupted by events. So, learn your local history, or rather, your ancestors' local history, so that dates or developments are like signals, enclosure, change of land ownership, new taxes, transport links. And after, say, 1750, you should always keep abreast of what is happening in the provincial newspapers. These, more than anything, provide a window on the lives that our ancestors were experiencing. Now, if you're researching a period when your family was agriculturally based, keep to hand the years of the great storms, the good and bad harvests, the peaks and troughs and the prices of bread. In some recent research for a parish history, I found a clear correlation between the price of bread and subsequent burials in the parish churchyard. Oh, and be aware of the years when the parish experienced a change of vicar. Here's some earlier episodes of the podcast. Episode 15. Let's talk of graves, of worms, of epitaphs. Episode 13 was about the hearth tax. Episode 12, and it was Shakespeare, for example. Episode 9 discussed the medieval pipe rolls. Go to episode 7 for the companions of William the Conqueror. Episode 2, the Herald's Visitations. And our very first episode looked at working with Tudor Wills. Building an audio library for the genealogists with too much time on their hands. Now, with each podcast, we take a couple of seconds out just to listen to an older episode so we can remember what was going on. And tonight's retrospective takes us back to episode 18 and a look at how the Magna Carta can impact on family history. The recording is still available, so uh, let's do a bit of eavesdropping. On the 19th of June, 1215... Bad King John gave his seal to the Magna Carta. 
But what did he do for today's David Carpenter, a Magna Carta specialist, compliments one of his predecessors, Professor J.C. Holt, for taking time to understand the links between the different families. Holt gained a unique understanding of the complex ties of lordship, neighbourhood, friendship and family that held together the local society on which John's government impacted. And you know, it seemed like a good idea for us to do the same. Now as I've said, that uh, episode is still available. The link is on the website talkgenealogy.blog Let's get back to tonight's talk on Samuel Pepys. The next thing that I pick up from looking at Pepys' life is that we should never pass over an opportunity to improve our own knowledge. For example, that Pepys marriage, he married young. But this was a time when the rules were changed and changed again during the periods of the Commonwealth and the Restoration. So what was the law about marriageable age at that time? Furthermore, no matter what the law said, was it unusual for a girl to marry at 14? Check within the extended family at the time and perhaps look at, I don't know, 50 or so other marriages. And if the marriage registers don't give the age, try the records of the marriage licences. This is not wasted time. If you work from your own empirical research, you will always be in a better position than the genealogist who relies on the impressions of others and old folk tales. So, what helping hands have been found so far? I suppose they can be summarised as never neglect the traditional printed sources, no matter how lowly your family. And that background knowledge, you know, is never wasted. It provides little alerts, little trips that send you down a new avenue of research to strengthen your understanding of your family's history. So I reckon we've had six reminders from Sam's history. The most obvious, but perhaps the most obviously overlooked, is that the diary itself exists as source material for London in the 1660s. Secondly, check on those printed sources, even for ordinary families, and not just the Herald's Visitations, but the other published genealogy. Number three, make those collateral lines tell you what is going on in the family. They have many more uses than simply helping you find a missing ancestor. Look into the history of other people, employers, masters, patrons, who impacted on your ancestor's life. Why them and why then? Next, put family history in the context of local history and work out how the lives were being knocked about by events. And then never miss those opportunities when your ancestors' lives prick you into improving your own knowledge of history. But of course, there's a further point that we can pick up. We've looked at Samuel Pepys's life, and he achieved much. He not only put the Navy and the Civil Service on a sounder footing, but he also left his diary for the benefit of posterity. Now I think it is important that for all the national good that he did, well, any genius could have done the same, he is best remembered for the diary, because it is personal. And that is what differentiated him from everyone else. So, what's the lesson here? Well, that's easy enough, isn't it? Write a diary. And make sure that it's still around for other folk to read in 400 years' time. Thank you for listening to episode 30 of the Talk Genealogy podcast. Please get in touch if you have any thoughts or comments or a family history story you'd like to tell. Once again, I'd like to remind you that the podcast is supported by our website, talkgenealogy.blog. 
Our favourite episodes at the moment seem to be number one, Talking with Tudor Wills, and the bonus episode addressed to American genealogists, but the stats do suggest that it's being accessed by as many enthusiasts in the UK. My next episode will be posted on the 3rd of November. Don't forget to start drawing up your Christmas list. My thanks to Freeze Effects for the music, Emily Brooks for the voiceover, and thank you for listening. Good night and God bless. Any questions or comments, any ideas or suggestions, you can contact the podcast through the website talkgenealogy.blog or through the Facebook page and there's Twitter of course on social media just search for Talk Genealogy I've written myself a book I guess the key words would be cricket that's simple enough Bingham which is a town near Nottingham in England and horseball, so taking together quite a narrow audience, which is why I've only printed a few copies. It's the history of four brothers who built the town's cricket team in the early 1800s. Their grandfather was my great time seven grandfather, so there's a touch of family history as we look at the tribulations of their farming furrows and their cricketing characters in Regency England. The horseballs, four brothers and cricket in Bingham, Ask wherever you buy your books, check it out through your local library, or contact me through my website, malcolmnoble.com. I'll tell you what, to make it easy, I'll make sure there's always a buy now on eBay. Malcolm Noble reads from his book, The Horsepools, Four Brothers and Cricket in Bingham. Number one, The Barrow Match. In 1819, four members of the Bingham team were called in to support Cropwell Bishop in their match against Barrow at Loughborough. Barrow was a team with a widespread reputation, boasting that they were justly far-famed and hitherto invincible. The match was eagerly anticipated. Both teams would have been aware that Barrow had been represented in the Leicester side, which had beaten Cropwell and Radcliffe in 1816. The Nottinghamshire Review announced on the 30th of July that the long-pending cricket match between Barrow on Saw and Cropwell would be played at Loughborough on Tuesday the 3rd of August, with a stake of 100 guineas. It had been agreed that Cropwell will be allowed four given men from Bingham, Stafford, Crook, Skinner and William Horsepool Jr. William Horsepool was a butcher in Bingham's marketplace. He would later turn to beer selling. At the time of the Barrow match, he and his wife Anne had a son and two daughters under ten years old. Two years after this cricket match, he effectively placed his assets in administration. The Horsepool families often dodged insolvency during these years, sometimes with more success than others. Betting, a few weeks before, had been 2-1 to in favour of Barrow, and on the day it was still 5 or 6-4. to Barrow were so confident of victory, that they arranged for flags, ribbons and a band to be on hand to celebrate their return home. The match was played over three days, Tuesday, Wednesday and Thursday. Barrow went into bat and the given men showed their value with Stafford taking a wicket and Crook taking a catch. Barrow notched up 81. Horsepool opened for Crockwell, but scored only two before he was run out. Stafford came home with 23, and the two other given men achieved 10 and 11. The first innings total was 95. 
Cropwell come Bingham were 14 notches to the good, but still the betting stayed with Barrow, with odds of two or three to one being offered. With their second innings, Barrow seemed to justify that optimism with a score of 120. Cropwell and Bingham needed 114 to win. Allspool opened the batting and was bowled for five. But Stafford built a score of 30 before being caught, leaving Crook, partnering Cropwell Smith, to secure the last few notches without the loss of a wicket. With seven byes, Cropwell and Bingham won by two wickets. And, says the newspaper, Barrow's glory was shorn of its beams. The paper continued, with ensigns of victory not being required on Barrow's part, one of the Bingham gentlemen civilly asked for the music to play See the Conquering Heroes Come, before them the victors on their entrance into Loughborough. This request being politely refused, the ringing of the bells and the shouts of the inhabitants of the latter mentioned town amply compensated for this lack of martial air. A better match was never played in this part of the country. After their victory, the butcher, cooper, publican and printer of Bingham no doubt drank well with their Cropwell teammates and Barrow opponents. The triumphant visitors cannot have left Loughborough before midnight, probably much later, so that when they began their 20 mile trek back to Bingham, the taste of victory would have well matured in their souls. Surely they would have had at least one horse and cart if only to carry the luggage of three days cricket, so there was probably room for all on board, although some would skip off to stretch their legs or relieve themselves in a ditch. It was a good bunch in a good mood. The drinking continued through the night and they had plenty of stories to tell before they reached Bingham. They dispersed to their homes in Long Acre and Market Street, but one detachment went straight to the church and rang the bells. It was only four o'clock in the morning, but they had promised to announce any victory as soon as they got home. The newspaper reported that the bells repeated their joyous celebrations at intervals during the day. And a full statement of the match is of course included in the book. James, John, William and Stephen Horsball were born in Nottinghamshire's market town of Bingham and played a pivotal role in establishing the town's early cricket team. Local teams regarded them as champions. Within a generation, they established a reputation as Knights of the Bat and Ball. Nottingham Show Cricket and Cricketers by Ashley Cooper recalled the Horsebulls long played a prominent part in Bingham cricket. Two generations gaining distinction at the game. The Horsebulls, Four Brothers and Cricket in Bingham by Malcolm Noble can be purchased through Amazon and eBay or ordered from wherever you buy your books. Visit malcolmnoble.com malcolmnoble.com